Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Speak Life to Youth and Children International, and I am Latanya Smith, also known as Miss LT, Sister LT, or Coach LT to those who know me personally like that. Um, and today we have our Purpose, Passion, and Career program class, and our presenter is very special to me because she is a relative. She's my first cousin. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing to see what she is going to talk about. Um, I've been following her for a while on Facebook, been chatting here and there. And um, just a little bit about SLIP. We've been in existence since October of 2019. And um, this is something God had given me back in 2007, 2006. And a lot of you have known me for many of years and many who are on this call, I've known no. childhood or a little bit of babies. And um, so I have a love and a passion for kids, most of you know, and I want to make a change and make a difference in the lives of young people for this generation and the next generation to come. So to know, to learn more about us, go to our website, www.slickinternationalslycinternational.com, all one word. You can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And at the end, I will tell you a little bit more about the fundraiser we are having currently and as, answer any questions that you may have. So Ms. LaBrenda Garrett Nelson, um, again, she's a relative of mine. She, has gone from lawyer to genealogist. And I'm just curious to understand and know how that transition happened. So without further ado, she will answer any questions toward the end. And I guess she'll explain how she wanna run this workshop or this class. If you have any questions in the chat, please do so. And Ms. LaBrenda, go ahead. Well, thank you, cousin. I'm really happy to uh, participate. I welcome those who are viewing this live and those who may view this in the future. I've been asked to talk about my two careers, uh, the career I had as a lawyer and the career I'm involved in now as a genealogist. And I, I hope you won't mind if in the context of that, I share some history with you. Um, not only history about my family, but history generally. I can move my screen. So some of you may have a fairly good idea of what lawyers do, but you may not be as familiar with genealogists and what professional genealogists do. So I wanted to begin by just explaining that a genealogist is a family historian, someone who tries to not only identify your ancestors, your parents, the parents of your parents, your great grandparents, but also to reconstruct their lives, to give you an idea of how they lived and what they lived through, to connect you to your past generations. Now you're gonna hear me talk about or mention now and then the issue or the, the notion of excellence. And when I talk about excellence, I'm not talking about being perfect in everything you do. I'm talking about doing your personal best, doing whatever you engage in, being the best that you can be. And I just wanted to make that clear unless I I don't want to mislead you. So as I thought about what I would talk to you about today, and, and again, if you have questions, um, my cousin will <laughs> flag any burning questions that you have as I speak. But I thought about the habits that I cultivated as I was growing up, as I was getting my education, and which of those habits led to pretty successful careers, the two careers I have had. And on this slide, you can see the five kind of habits that I thought I would talk to you about 
and explain how these habits helped me in pursuing my career. Um, and the first is that I was pretty passionate about both of the careers that I have chosen. And the second is that it was important to me, and I think it will be important to you to face down your challenges as they come up in life. It was also important, especially for young African-Americans to go the extra mile. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. And networking, doing what you're doing now, listening to this uh, talk about careers is a form of networking, making connections with people who can help you along your way. And the last thing I'll talk about is just the importance of giving back. I mean, we don't become successful or pursue uh, careers just for ourselves. We also benefit when we use our talents and what we've learned, what we've earned to help other people. So those are the general topics I'm going to cover. So this is me. This is me when I was about a year old. And I wanted to start with me at that point because I was born in a little town in the upstate of South Carolina. And the year I was born was the year before the Supreme Court decided that segregated schools were unconstitutional. So when I was born, there were, that was a challenge that I faced before I even knew that there was a challenge. Being born in a small town in the upstate of South Carolina before the Supreme Court decided that they should start moving the country towards away from segregation, or at least toward an equitable educational system for all children, including African-Americans. The, uh, you may have seen just last week, a news report about a female team of uh, athletes who, from Howard University, who visited Presbyterian College. I did not realize, I heard the story and didn't realize that it was a college in my home county in South Carolina. And these Howard University students were greeted with racial slurs being yelled at them from behind a fence. And it made national news. And um, I'm sharing that because we have come a very long way from the year in which I was born where it wasn't even clear that I would have the opportunity to get an education to today, but even today, we face challenges. Your challenges will be very different from the ones that I chase, faced, but you will face challenges. That is what life is all about. So these are my parents. And this is my mom, who is the sister of <laughs> my cousin's brother. And I want to mention them because your foundation is very important. It's important to have people to encourage you in life. They may be your parents, they may be a teacher, they may be a minister, but things will happen that you don't have control over. And one of the things that happened to me was that when I was about ready to begin school, my parents moved me to Brooklyn, New York, which was you know, a great thing for me because it was, I was living in New York at a time when public education involved music programs in a city that had so many great museums to visit. Um, there were lots of wonderful reasons in, that my parents that resulted in lots of wonderful things that resulted from my father and mother making the decision to move me to New York. So I count them among my encouragers, among the people who laid a foundation for me. And these are others. So the woman on the right 
is our grandmother. And she worked hard all of her life. And she died when she was younger than I am now. My mother only very recently um, shared a story that I'll share with you, because just as you will face challenges that are different from the challenges your parents face, we, my, my mother faced very different challenges. My mother, uh, I knew that most of my life that while she was alive, that our grandmother cooked in a restaurant in, on the town square in my hometown. And when I was a child, it was a restaurant that black people were not allowed to go into. Um, but she was a great cook. She had a photograph in the newspaper because she was such a great cook. What I did not know until very recently, about five years ago, my mother shared that when my mother was a little girl, she could not go into the public library to take out books. And that was amazing to me because in Brooklyn, that was one of my favorite places to go. In fact, if I, if I otherwise would have been stuck at home, if I said I was going to the library, my mother would let me go. So it was a place I frequented. So the idea that my mother could not go to the library during the day was amazing to me. And what my mother shared though, was that she got to go to the library and to read books because her mother, my grandmother cleaned the library in the evenings. So my mother would go with her and read the books. That was a challenge my mother faced that I did not have to face. And the other person you see on this slide is my father's paternal grandfather, his father's father. And he, his memory is very special to me. And it's one of the reasons that I became interested in genealogy, in family history. Because although he died before my father was even born, we grew up hearing stories about him and how hard he worked to acquire land that he was able to leave to his children and his grandchildren. And even today, some of his great grandchildren are living on land that he worked hard to acquire. And this is a favorite photo because in addition to family members, you may find an encourager in a teacher. So this is my sixth grade class photo in Brooklyn, New York. And there you see I'm circled and the person who was my absolute favorite teacher. I was fortunate because I was in the very first class that she taught. So she had a great deal of enthusiasm and she really did try to instill in her students that the sky was the limit and that they could do anything they wanted to do. And we lost touch over the years, but her son found me on Facebook and we have reconnected. I just, uh, this is a photo of us on the day we reconnected in person. I just was in New York a few months ago and had lunch with her again because she was an encourager and, and, I, and holds a special place in my heart. And then the last person I'll share is my father's mother. I, I think I told someone recently that I think she primed me to be interested in genealogy because she's the one who shared so many stories about her family and her husband's family that Garrett, great grandfather of mine was her father-in-law. Um, she and all of her people were born in that same little town that I was born in. And I, in fact, I lived with her for the early years of my life when my parents were in New York before they finally brought us up there. So she had a great deal to do with how I viewed the world and also in my interest in genealogy. So talking about pursuing your passion and why that is so important. Um, I want to tell you that my motivations for becoming a lawyer were very different from my motivation for what I'm doing now. The 
I didn't know very much about what being a lawyer was about when I was a kid, but my mother tells me that I was about 12 when I started telling people that I was going to be a lawyer. And all that I knew about it was from an old show on TV called Perry Mason. And I've heard this from other people, white and black people who all across the country, it was an old show shot in black and white. And Perry Mason every week would not only end up in a courtroom defending a client, but he would solve crimes and get people to confess on the stand. They did a, a remake of Perry Mason on one of the cable channels recently. That was a much darker version of, of that mm -hmm. show. But I watched that show religiously. And that really is all that I knew about being a lawyer. But I also was an avid reader. So I learned some things reading. And I made up my mind that what I didn't want to be, and this is not a good motivation, but I'm being honest about what my motivation was. I didn't want to be poor. And it seemed as if people who were lawyers or doctors were not poor. <laughs> I didn't think that I could hack being a doctor, the blood and all of that stuff, right? But I thought I might be able to be a lawyer. And so I put that in my head and I was passionate about it, not, again, not for any pure reason, but because I really was determined to be a professional and to have a career. And the only one I knew a little bit about was the law. Now, genealogy was entirely different. I grew up as many children today do in the South, where people are a lot more serious about who your people are and knowing about your family. So again, I was kind of primed to be interested in genealogy. And then came the TV show Roots. And this is another like thing that happened in American society that affected black and white people. Roots, and I'm not talking about the recent remake, I'm talking about the original 1970s show was just history making because it was the first time that lots of Americans, black and white, got it into their heads that you didn't have to be royalty or famous to want to know who your people were, your ancestors, or to be able to figure out who those people were. And the wonderful thing, the phenomenal thing about Roots was that the characters were African-American, that even African-Americans could figure out who their ancestors were, which is something that's really important, having that connection to the people who are responsible for you being here today. So even before I retired from the practice of law, I was passionate about genealogy. And I recall when I still lived in New York, coming down, this is they, This is before the internet, when you could just go online and find out some things, although not all things. Going down to Washington, DC, where I actually live now, and going to the National Archives and just being thrilled to see the name of a great grandfather in the US census records. Um, today, there, there's so much more available, and I'll talk about that a little later. but. Genealogy is a true passion. I called it, it was my avocation before it became my profession. And I engaged in it before I stopped practicing law. So the other thing I wanted to talk about um, is the importance of facing challenges. Because as I said, everyone will have challenges in life. Nobody gets out of life, gets out of here without facing challenges. And the thing that you have to keep in mind is how important it is not to let other folk discourage you from a goal that you have set for yourself. Um, again, your challenges are going to be different from mine, but you're going to have them. And you can't be afraid to just face them down. Um, this is an article that appeared a few years ago, about four years ago in my college magazine, and it talks about um, 
students who were parents, but were able to still achieve success. And that in the lower right-hand corner is a photo of me with my daughter while I was a college student and me with my daughter a few years ago. So it was very challenging being a student and being and having a child. When I applied to law school, I was married and had a young child. And so it was, uh, in fact, I recall uh, someone saying to me, oh, are you still going to law school? And it just never dawned on me that this, my daughter's birth meant I couldn't go to law school. Now, because I was, I did have a young family, I did limit my applications to schools that were in New York where I was living, but I still ended up in at what is on everybody's list of top 10 law schools, NYU Law School. And the, the moral of the story is that if you have a goal, it seems as if you can, it seemed to me that you all of your decisions about life will revolve around that goal and you can face the challenge by keeping that in mind. Passion is important. I was determined to go to law school and uh, having applying when I was married and, and had a young child didn't stop that. So this is uh, the day I graduated from law school. I was 25 years old. And the person on the left was my father-in-law and the person on the right was my dad. And they were all very happy. <laughs> I think there were folks who did not think it would happen, but the fact of the matter is um, it did. And you know, graduating from law school didn't end my challenges because this was in the, the late 1970s. And at that time, one of the coveted jobs to get was a job at a big New York law firm. But big New York law firms were not hiring a lot of Black people. And older law students, when I was in law school, actually some of them were discouraging younger law students from even applying to those jobs. That's not the way to face a challenge. I. Uh, I was listening to these folks and then I was, I became aware that other people whose grades were not necessarily as good as mine were getting offers or at least um, they were getting interviews with these law firms. And so I did apply and I did get one of those jobs when I graduated from law school, because the thing, the way it worked then, and, and you know, the world changes and the market could be a little different now, but the way it worked then was that you got a summer job with one of these places, and that kind of set you up to get a permanent job with that firm, or at least to bring you to the attention of other firms. And I ended up going with the firm that gave me that summer job. And here I am, this was the class of people I entered with on the left. I was the only black lawyer in the New York office. The firm had a Washington office and the black lawyer there was former uh, cabinet secretary, Patricia Robert Harris. But in the New York office, this was the entering class of first year associates and there I was. Um, so that was the challenge faced by the law. On the genealogy side, and before I start talking about this, I wanna say that um, things are different now for the most part. But when I was seven years old in 1960, the National Genealogical Society, which was organized in about 1903, I think, had the first black genealogist apply for membership. And this is just a snippet from an article that was in the Washington Post because they didn't know what to do. A subsequent article that was published in a paper in Alabama and to the credit of the current uh, National Genealogical Society, it was their, one of their people who found the article that reported that they had a vote and the national membership voted to bar black people from joining. So when I was seven years old, if I had been older and if I'd wanted to 
if I decided I wanted to be a genealogist, this organization would not have admitted me. As I've said, they come a long way since then, but there were, because of this attitude, there were things that happened that made it more difficult for genealogists researching African-Americans to do work, to do the work that they need to do. For example, even in my hometown where there is a genealogy society that I'm a member of, for years they were publishing books. And when I, I wasn't living there, I would buy them, order them. There was a book, these hardcover books, pricey books of cemeteries. So I ordered them. Not a single African-American cemetery was included in these books. That's the kind of thing that was happening. That started changing around the 70s, but even, um, and recently, in fact, the society has published in my hometown uh, cemetery books that include graveyards of black churches, but even those, they're like, they're not nicely bound in, in you know, they're, they've done it, but they, it's not the way they used to do it. So genealogy, being a genealogist also presented some challenges um, that the community is still grappling with. So the second thing I mentioned was the importance of going the extra mile. And I am sure that many of you have heard this before, and it really, unfortunately, is still true that for many African-Americans in certain settings, you really do have to go the extra mile to prove yourself to not, um, well, to prove yourself. When I was uh, beginning to practice law, for some reason, the people who made it into the big law firms, a lot of them uh, were litigators. It was as if people were saying, well, black people can do well in the courtroom, which is not what I ever did in my practice. And there were some people doing securities work, but I chose an area that is still viewed as a difficult area, but it's one where people could objectively measure how well I was doing. And that is how I became a tax lawyer. And in terms of going the extra mile, the firm I started with actually paid to, for the associates to get LLMs. You might've seen those initials after my name. So I got a JD, which was a law degree. And then I got an LLM, which is a master's in law degree that you get after you get a law degree. And at the time, I didn't really require it. In fact, the partners at the firm I worked at told me that they could teach me everything I needed to know. But I took advantage of the fact that they were paying the tuition for me to go back to my law school to the graduate tax program and to get this graduate tax degree. And I really believe that, that having that degree at that time gave me an edge over other folks as I moved on to other jobs. Um, today, it's all but required for young tax lawyers to do this. But at the time, it was something that, um, it was a way of going the extra mile to show people how serious I was about becoming a tax lawyer and also simply to hone my skills so that I could be the best tax lawyer I could be. So my decision to apply for a job at a major New York law firm and then to enhance my legal credentials with a graduate tax degree led to the best job I, I had as a lawyer. I got hired to work on the staff of the Joint Tax Committee for the US Congress. And at the time, today, things in Washington are so partisan. It's like, are you, are you Republican? Are you a Democrat? But in my day on the Hill, that really wasn't an issue when it came to the tax law. Republicans and Democrats may have had different social aims, economic aims, but the tax staff was nonpartisan. You didn't have to be Republican or Democrat to be hired by it. And you worked for both the Senate Tax Writing Committee and the House Tax Writing Committee. 
And I had the good luck to be there when to get hired a few years before we did what was really landmark legislation. Um, when I was born, there was something called the Internal Revenue Code of 1954, and that governed the taxation of everybody and every com company. I worked on the Tax Reform Act of 1986, and that's the code that's still in effect, even though there have been lots of changes in recent years. And that really was the um, best job I had in terms of being able to make a social impact because that legislation took a lot of people off of the tax rolls. It did a lot of other good things. And as a result of that, I got this write up in the New York Daily News, which is not the New York Times, but it is actually the circulation is probably larger than the New York Times. And this was the paper my family read. And it wasn't something that I saw it. It wasn't something that I went looking for a reporter to write an article about me. It has more to do with when you're pursuing your passion and doing the job to the best of your ability, people may recognize that and, and, get noted, and you get noticed for it. On the genealogy side, again, I started writing this book about researching African Americans in my home county in South Carolina as an assignment for a class I was taking. Because just as I did in the case of the law, I spent many years when genealogy was just a hobby, working at it very seriously, but not knowing what I was doing. And then I learned that there were institutes and classes that I could take. And when I started this, I should mention, 25 years ago, you didn't have all the institutes and all of the learning opportunities that genealogists have today, but there were some around when I got serious about genealogy. And one of the uh, classes that I took required you to kind of do a research guide for a place you're familiar with researching in. And I did it about my home county in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I turned it into a book and made it much more detailed. And this was a case where I did, uh, someone suggested to me that I send a copy to um, a guy who for 30 something years has been writing a genealogy column for a major newspaper, the Atlanta Journal Constitution. And he gave me this terrific write-up. Um, I'm, I'm not as good at, at, as marketing, at marketing as I am at writing and genealogy. So if I had been, I would have chosen a title like this, that this is a book that people say, in, beginning with this article, that anyone can use as a guide because it talks about the kinds of records that can help to reconstruct the lives of your African-American ancestors and what you do with those records. All of that, all of this is uh, resulted from going the extra mile. And then when I started taking classes, I learned that there was something called the Board for Certification of Genealogists. I had no idea that such an organization existed. So there are two different credentialing bodies for genealogists, and this is an independent body. It started out as an independent body to which genealogists can submit their work and have it reviewed by experienced genealogists to see whether you are meeting genealogy standards. And this organization was organized in 1964. And when I heard about it, of course, this was another challenge to be faced. So I decided that I was going to apply to become a certified genealogist because I wanted people to know that I know what I'm doing. And I also wanted to know for myself that I was doing things the right way. Because once I started taking classes, I realized that I had a lot to learn, which is something else to keep in mind in both the legal area and as a genealogist that the learning never really stops. There's always something new to learn. And so I did apply, and I, I should mention this too, that this organization was 
organized in 1964. And I think, I think I'm correct that when I applied in 2015 and I was got the certified genealogist credential, I was only about the fifth person that had ever, the fifth African-American to get that credential. Now we have more today, thank goodness, but um, I think people were not applying because for a variety of reasons, um, but it's something that, it was another challenge to be faced. I think I've already mentioned that just as I did in the law, I have, um, even after receiving my, becoming uh, the, getting the certified genealogist credential, I have continued to attend institutes as a student, especially for example, um, to learn about using DNA for genealogical research. That is the one of the newest tools in the toolbox of genealogists and it's complicated and there is a lot to learn. So talking about networking, this is a, I'm sure most of you have heard this recited to you at some point or another. It's from Proverbs in the Bible, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And I like this quote because it reminds me uh, about the importance of networking and meeting other people who can help you along your way in whatever career you decide to uh, engage in. The, um, when I was practicing law, it was a matter of meeting, attending American Bar Association meetings and starting to uh, become involved in those committees to meet other people who could be helpful in a variety of things like sending you clients or uh, putting in a good word for you if you were going to, looking to change jobs. That's one aspect of networking. Let's see. So when I was in the law, when I moved to DC, this was a group called the Tax Coalition. It was a group of women because when I moved to DC, there were still not a lot of women on Capitol Hill working in the tax area or in corporate America. And so those of us who were in that in that uh, sphere got together and it was a great networking opportunity. People I met in this group are still friends today. When I was practicing law, some of them sent me business, gave me business if they were working for a company. Networking was important when I practiced law and it was it's important as a when I work as a genealogist. This is a, on the right is a group, it's called the Progen Study Group. And it's a great group because it, um, there's a book entitled Professional Genealogy. And they have uh, cohorts of classes and they have a certified or accredited genealogist as a mentor and a coordinator. And they take you through that book. And I participated as part of my preparation to submit a portfolio to uh, apply for the certified genealogist credential. And at every institute or conference, they have progen alumni get together. And this was taken at a conference uh, a few years ago where the people who had gone through progen were um, just gathered for a group photo. And, and we do that lots of places. And again, in genealogy, um, it's even more important, I think, than it was for me in the law to maintain contacts with folks who are active in your area. So if you have a question about something, someone may be able to answer it for you or point you in the direction of where you can find the answer. And again, there are lots of uh, referrals of clients. I refer business to folks um, a lot because I don't really take clients, I do, I had enough of clients when I was practicing law. So I do work on a very selective basis, but I get inquiries all the time and I'll just refer business to people and, and I'm sure other folks do the same thing. That's kind of the importance and the power of networking in whatever career you're involved in. 
And then to talk about giving back. Um, giving back is not just, uh, I'm, I'm not talking just about like donating money and getting a tax deduction. Probably the most valuable thing you can do in your profession is to give your time. So for example, on the left is a little place card that was on the table of the pre-law institute at my college. I, I also uh, serve on the board of my college foundation. And it's an important way, it's important to me to give back. I got so much out of that college. Um, apart from NYU Law School, I think I found my bearing there and I had a great professors and so I do lots of things for my college in, in the form of giving back. But it's also good for me um, because I learn in the process of whatever I'm doing. Um, that's true in genealogy also. So I mentioned the progen group. I went through the program and then I became a mentor to a group of people learning. And that's what you see on the right. Just a certificate. Um, an appreciation for my mentoring this Progen 37 study group. And again, when I um, did this, a new uh, edition or of professional genealogy had been published. So going through this not only um, afforded me the opportunity to give back to the study group, but it also meant that I had to read through this new book. So I got a lot out of it too. And it's always a two-way street when you're doing this. There's some uh, good that comes out of it from your perspective as well. And then I thought I would just talk a little bit about what it was I actually did as a lawyer and as a genealogist. And the as I thought about this and what I would say to you today, I realized that a lot of the same qualities that um, enabled me to have a fairly successful legal career are the same qualities that I have been able to use in pursuing genealogy. I, you know, I like puzzles. I like figuring things out. I like doing crossword puzzles and being a tax lawyer involved that same kind of ability to analyze details and, and come up with solutions, that same um, an analysis um, and, the other thing I like doing is, is, and this ties into giving back, is sharing my knowledge with folk. So when I was practicing law, I got invited to be um, a adjunct professor of law, a part-time lawyer. I taught one class for five years um, at the Georgetown University Law Center, a very well-regarded law school. And that's my, I don't throw anything away. So this is my, adjunct professor card that I had when I went to, was teaching at Georgetown. And now as a genealogist, and it, most of my work involves lecturing, lecturing at institutes, lecturing at conferences. And again, these activities not only um, are ways to give back, but they're ways for me to keep on top of developments on to enhance my knowledge of the area that I'm working in. And, and I'll say too, that I kind of pride myself on specializing in African-American genealogy. Now the standards are the same, whether whatever community or ethnicity you're researching in. So I know a lot about methodology and strategies, but my, uh, my concerns, my, focus is on researching the ancestries of families that survived American slavery. And even when I'm teaching about um, methodology or strategies, I used examples from my research, which invariably involves um, American, uh, African-Americans. What is, what's different about African-American genealogy especially when you're researching enslaved ancestors, is that 
it requires that you also research the white slaveholders because black people, black people were not, the law said that you couldn't teach enslaved people to read and write. So very few of them had the ability to create their own records. So the records that we use in researching African-American families whose ancestors were enslaved are records that were created by or with respect to the slaveholders. That's just a point of history. So in both professions, I have engaged in teaching. In addition to uh, Georgetown Law School, I would also present at panels at the Bar Association and that kind of thing. And then researching. That's the other thing that's common to both professions. Um, now, when I was a lawyer, my research involved was very different. I was, uh, I did a lot of reading of the Internal Revenue Code and regulations explaining the Internal Revenue Code and books. And this book is actually a book that was edited by one of my law school classmates. And I actually, I actually wrote one of the chapters in this book. But being a lawyer involved, a tax lawyer in particular, involved researching. Well, genealogy involves a lot of researching. Um, the genealogical proof standard, the first requirement is that you do reasonably exhaustive research. But I'm looking at very different kind of documents. I'm looking at very old documents, like the one you can see on the screen. And I'm trying to glean as much information as I can about, in my case, enslaved ancestors. So if researching is something that you like, either of these professions might be something that would interest you. And then the other thing that I do um, and that I did as a lawyer and that I do as a genealogist is writing. And I've, um, when I was a lawyer, I wrote and was published in law reviews on tax matters. And, and on the left, you see a snippet from an article I published some time ago in the George Washington uh, University International Law Review. And on the, that's on my left actually. The, in the other uh, column, you see the cover of the book I was telling you about, the book I wrote about researching African-American ancestors in my home county and a snippet from an article that I wrote about my paternal grandmother's family, my father's mother's family. The other thing about sharing, about publishing as a genealogist is that I am sharing information about how to do this research with other people. And I'm also putting the information out there in the hope that I can discover other branches of my family that we don't know about yet. And I've had that happen, that someone's read something and then contacted me because they realized that they were connected to the family that I had written about. And then, you know, this is a kind of related to teaching, but the, and I think I mentioned this, that as a lawyer, I often participated in panel discussions talking about tax. And I've done the same thing as a genealogist. So on the right, you can see that they both look like fun bunches, right? I think we were at a retreat on the left and those, those are a bunch of lawyers. And on the right is a panel I was on at an institute a few years ago. It was actually a panel about using DNA. And, I, and sometimes, I haven't done it for a while, but sometimes I actually, um, I'll, I'll take a booth at a conference to sell my book. But the thing about even doing that is having the opportunity to talk to folks about what's in the book and um, how it could be useful to them. And then I just wanted to um, talk about the importance of kind of having a work-life balance. You can't have like all work and no play. You have to pay some attention to your personal life, your personal growth. Um, 
and this is this is my husband and we try to do that so we before the pandemic we traveled a lot um and he often accompanies me to um genealogy conferences and institutes because he too retired from a prior life um and we have also been very active in church because he is a, an ordained Baptist uh, preacher. But the important thing is that I don't want to leave you with the impression that you have to devote yourself to study and never pay attention to getting some enjoyment out of life and doing the things that you enjoy doing. And now I'm, this is gonna kind of end my prepared remarks. I just wanted to um, again, emphasize that following my passion when I, as a tax lawyer, you know, landed me on the cover above the fold of USA Today back when the Tax Reform Act of 1986 was being ushered through Congress. And because I'm even more passionate about being, geneal being a genealogist, just last year, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal contacted me. And she found me, uh, my name on the program for the National Black Genealogy Society, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. And she was looking to write something about a black person using DNA to connect with ancestors. And so I got this great write up that you can find online. And again, it's not because I, in either case was kind of seeking to be written up, it was because I've been following my passion and it's led to good success. So I'll just summarize what I've been talking about. Find your passion and follow your passion and don't let anyone discourage you or tell you what can't be done. You're gonna face challenges and the important thing there is not to be afraid to face them down. Don't let anybody discourage you with what hasn't been done before. And it's still important, whether you're African-American or not, to go the extra mile to distinguish yourself from other folks going after the same thing. And now I'm ready for questions. Well, do we have any questions? I have several, but before we have, uh, before I asked mine, anybody online would like to ask theirs. Are you letting them turn their cameras on? Yeah, y'all could turn your cameras on, turn your mics on, ask a question, please. Don't be shy. Have I, uh, is there anything I talked about that you um, had a question about that I didn't make clear? Oops, let me do it. Don't have me any, me, any, mine, and mo, because you know I'll call you out. So ask a question, please. I see a 12th grader uh, maybe that... thinking about college. Azar, uh, you want to share what? what you're planning on going to college for, what you're majoring in? No, you, okay. Gerard, did you want to say something? No. <laughs> Was I so clear? <laughs> oh, he thinks his mic isn't working. Okay, Ch chat if you have a question or a comment. Ch uh, type it in the chat. Azara. I know her mom told me she wants to go to school for dance. I've been sending um, several scholarships their way. Um, That's great. The whole family, I believe, is talented. Mom plays instrumentation. She's a band director. 
um, at one of the high schools in South Carolina. Um, their father, Gerard Sr., plays drums and percussion. So I know this, this family is very talented and as well as the artist. Gerard Jr., what do you enjoy doing? Just type it in the chat if you can't talk. Okay, Zon. <laughs> oh man, stop being embarrassed. Oh, are you talking? Cause your mic is off or I can't hear you. Okay, his mic. Well, Latanya, maybe you should ask your questions. <laughs> okay, so I want to say I almost started crying when I saw the. Why? <laughs> I have that same picture of my grandmother, and I've always wondered what type of person she was. What did she do? And I'm glad you shared a little bit of that because I did not know that. Um, so that really blessed me just to hear that. Um. So my question, well, a couple, does DNA truly track your genealogy or, or where are you from? Well, see, a lot of people take these DNA tests from the commercial companies, mm -hmm. thinking that those companies can tell you exactly where you came from. And the science is not there yet. What the science can do is they can tell you where you're from on a continental level. When, when populations have been isolated from each other um, for, for thousands of years. So before there was transatlantic travel, they can tell you where you're kind of about your deep ancestry. They can tell you that um, you have ancestors who were in sub-Saharan Africa, and they can tell you that you have ancestors who were in Western Europe, but despite the commercials, there isn't that much difference in the DNA of like uh, a German and a Frenchman. They're all, these are all places that are, some of these places are smaller than American states. So imagine, if people took tests and, and tried to figure out who, what state someone was from, but they can tell you where your deep ancestry is. Okay. That's the best. But on the other hand, um, the I wrote an article that got published two years ago that used DNA, and, and this is what that Wall Street Journal article is about, to confirm the identity of my Garrett third great grandparents, but DNA alone can't tell you every, anything. You have to do document as much as you can and then see if the DNA either is consistent with that or it's not consistent with it. Okay, so it's not as easy as- Right, it, because see the there, there, there are different tests. So there's the test that can look at your deep ancestry that can tell you pretty much on a continental level where your people were. But then there is a test that looks at the DNA you get from both of your parents. And beyond about a second cousin, really, really beyond a first cousin, you could have a range of uh, shared DNA that could be any number of, of, of relationships. Okay. So it's really, you really do need to still do the traditional work that genealogists do before you even look at DNA as a way for any of, for any information that it can give you. Okay. Gerard did tight. Um, he I say it. It's in the family. He loved. He likes playing drums and he likes to sing. Oh, that's wonderful. It's a musical, artistic family. So you have oh, to follow your passion. And that was the other thing that kind of make me tear up just a little bit Why? <laughs> because yeah, when you say stated your passions can lead to several professions which actually it can and how you broke that down 
that's what I'm trying to get my youth to realize just because uh, you can dance, you can also teach with that dance, you can also do. Right, and, and that's true about the law in general. The law affects every human endeavor, everything that happens in the world and the tax law especially. So whatever your interests are, you can find, an, if you became a lawyer, you can find an area. I know someone who works for a movie studio and their job as a lawyer is to make sure that, this, that every film gets the rights to use music that's used in the film. Like, so someone who's interested in movies that wants to, or music, that's a, a lawyer, there's a job for a lawyer there. And the same thing is kind of true of genealogists. There are so many different areas you can specialize in, including a lot of people over the last 20 years have become DNA experts. And those are basically my two questions on that. You answered through the, those answers, you just answered everything else. So for my young people online, I have a $25 Visa gift card that someone can win. If you can tell me what is the date of the first uh, internal revenue code that Ms. LeBrenda mentioned. Can anybody tell me the date, meaning the year of the first internal revenue code that she mentioned in her presentation. I want to see your faces. Everybody put your camera on. Can anybody tell me? What was that year that she mentioned that first year? Let's see how close you were paying attention. So I tell you what, your parents have my phone number. So the first person to text me that date, which means you have to go back and look at the video once I post it on YouTube. The first person that texts me that date gets a $25 Visa gift card that year rather, okay? So you're gonna have to go back and listen to the presentation. See, I take notes. But Ms. LeBrenda, I want to thank you. Anybody else have any questions before we hang up? Our other, your cousin, my sister is online, Mache. I don't know if she want to say anything. Apparently not. Oh, maybe she is. Unless she's driving. She may be driving. But if not, thank you so much. Hopefully you'll get your shirt. All right, they're asking, what was the question again? In her presentation, she mentioned uh, the year of the first internal revenue code. She mentioned that first year, she mentioned two different years. I want the first one she mentioned. That was the question. So you're going to have to go back. Uh, the video will be posted on YouTube within the next 30 minutes. Um, I will send the email to your mom and dad. Okay, Victoria? But Ms. LeBrenda, hopefully you'll get your shirt Monday. Okay. It's still saying it arrives shortly. It's late. So just let me know. We will be touching base because I want to send you a special gift, you and your husband. Thank you, cousin. Uh, Thank you for having me. No problem. I really enjoyed it and it really blessed my spirit and just, and I knew it was a lot more to DNA and ancestry than what we saw on TV and what they're proclaiming. I know it goes much deeper than that. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, somebody, Victoria, Miss LaBrenda was 1913 or 1950. I didn't mention 1913, but I mentioned 1954. So, Miss Victoria, you have won a $25 uh, Visa gift card. 
I get with your mom and try to arrange that. Congratulations. See what you get when you're part of Slick online. So I will reach out to you shortly after we hang up. So thank you again. And um, I will say, okay, what is your top three, top three favorite pound cakes? Oh, me? Uh-huh. Oh, I don't know. I guess um, I like lemon. Okay. And, and plain, I would say. <laughs> Okay, you will begin a either a lemon rainbow pound cake or a cream cheese pound cake. I make cakes from scratch. Oh. So uh, I'll be reaching out to you shortly and making sure, and I'm going to ensure to make sure it get there within two days and not two weeks. Like you well, should. thank you. So that would be thank something you and your husband can enjoy. And um, I make excellent cakes. A lot of people will tell you, so. Good to know. <laughs> okay. But thank you again. Thank you for having well, me. Have a wonderful day. Stay warm up there because I know y'all got a lot more snow. And um, stay safe. Love y'all and see y'all next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.